Swami Abhedananda. Ascertaining what is right and what is wrong is a great dilemma in human life. Sometimes people try to hide their mistakes by keeping quiet, concealing the truth, philosophizing and excusing improper conduct or arguing to defend their actions. This is the nature of weak people. That person is truly great who does not hesitate to confess a mistake and tries to correct it immediately. Sometimes students do not see their own mistakes, so a real teacher always comes forward to correct them. Kali was serving his guru, Sri Ramakrishna, during his last illness at the Kos Sipore Garden House. There were two ponds in the compound, stocked with plenty of fish. Kali was a good angler. One day he caught some fish, and news of this reached the master. In the evening when Kali was serving him, the master asked, Is it true that you have been catching many fish with a fishing rod? Yes, sir. The master said, It is a sin to catch fish with a fishing rod, for thereby living beings are killed. In defense Kali quoted from the Gita, He who thinks that the self is the slayer as well as he who thinks that the self is slain is ignorant, for the self neither slays nor is slain to point one nine. He further added, So why should it be a sin to catch fish? Ramakrishna smiled and tried to make Kali understand through various arguments. He said, When a person attains true knowledge, he does not take a false step. Suddenly the master began coughing and there was a trace of blood in his sputum. Frightened by this, Kali told him, Sir, talking will aggravate your cancer. Please do not talk anymore. But the master said, I consider you to be one of the most intelligent of the boys. You will understand if you meditate on what I have said. According to Ramakrishna's instructions, Kali meditated for three days and realized the meaning behind his statement. He went to the master and said, Sir, I have now realized why it is wrong to catch fish. I shall not do it again. Please forgive me. The master was very pleased to hear this. He said, It is deceitful to catch fish in this way. Hiding a hook inside bait, and hiding poison in food offered to an invited guest are sins of the same kind. Kali humbly accepted what the Master said and felt his infinite compassion. Ramakrishna continued, It is true that the Atman does not die nor is it killed. But he who has realized this truth is the Atman himself, so why should he have the tendency to kill others? As long as the tendency to kill remains, he is not identified with the Atman nor does he have any self-knowledge. That is why I say that when one attains true knowledge, one does not take any false step. You should realize that the Atman is beyond the body, the sense organs, the mind and the intellect and that it is the witness of phenomena. One the Master's words penetrated Kali's heart and he realized the truth. Kali Prasad Chandra was born on Tuesday, 2nd October 1866, at 21 Nimu Goswami Lane, Aheritola, North Calcutta. His father, Rasiklal Chandra, was an English teacher in the Oriental Seminary. His first wife died, leaving a son and a daughter. This son's name was Biharilal, he later became a Christian. At the request of friends and relatives, Rasiklal married Nayantara Devi, a gentle and spiritual girl who was 14 years old. She was an ideal wife. In the course of time she had nine children, the first five of them died at an early age of the remaining four, Kali was the second. Before Kali was born, Nayantara prayed to the Divine Mother Kali for a son. When the child was born, she gave him the name Kali Prasad, or the blessings of Mother Kali. In 1871, at the age of five, Kali was admitted to Govinda Seals Nursery School, where he studied for two years. He learned the alphabet, heard stories from the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, 
and began to memorize Sanskrit verses on morality and ethics. He then joined Jadyu Pandit's Banda Vidyalaya, and in the evening he would go to a Sanskrit school at Hatibgan, where he studied Sanskrit grammar. Kali was a bright student and a voracious reader. During this period, along with his regular courses, he studied classical Sanskrit literature, including the Hitopodesha, Raghuvansham, Kumar Sambhavam, Shakuntala, and Bhatti Kavyam. He learned prosody and could compose verses in Sanskrit. At the age of 10, Kali was admitted to the Oriental Seminary, the well known high school where his father taught English. One needs sound health in order to practice spiritual disciplines. Although from his boyhood Kali was more interested in developing his intellect, he did not neglect his health. He swam regularly in the Ganges with his friends and exercised daily in a neighborhood gymnasium. However, once Kali had read Herbert Spencer's Education, in which the author claims that those who do vigorous physical exercise do so at the expense of their brains, he stopped going to the gymnasium. Kali had studied Wilson's History of India and there had learned about Shankaracharya, the great exponent of Vedanta. Shankara's life and works inspired young Kali and thenceforth he cherished a desire to become a pandit and philosopher like him. Kali took a drawing class in school and within a year excelled. The teacher praised his skill and prophesied a bright future for him, but one day Kali told the teacher that he would not come to the drawing class anymore because he had decided to become a philosopher. Kali's teacher tried to convince him that it was better to be a painter than a philosopher. But Kali replied, No, Sira painter studies the surface of things, but a philosopher goes below the surface and studies the causes of things. So I want to be a philosopher, to Kali had been extremely inquisitive from his boyhood. To satisfy his hunger for knowledge, he would ask his father various questions that surprised the wise English teacher. In addition, Kali would use his savings to buy books instead of refreshments. Kali had a remarkable memory and keen power of concentration. He learned to fish, shop, cook, work with wood, garden, bind books, and so on. When he was 14, he found a copy of the Bhagavad Gita in his father's study and began reading it. But his father told him that it was too difficult a book for one so young, taking the book away from Kali, he hid it in his room. When his father left the house, Kali searched for the book and located it. In the dead of night when everybody was asleep, he read the Gita by the light of an oil lamp. In the 1880s Calcutta was the capital of India and the city pulsated with cultural activities as well as political and religious movements. Kali attended the lectures of Surendranath Banerjee, a great national leader Keshab Chandra Sen and Pratap Chandra Majumdar, the famous Brahmo leaders, and Reverend Kali Charan Banerjee, a Christian evangelist. At that time Hindu leaders were working to protect their religion from the onslaught of Christian propaganda. In 1882-1983 Pandit Shashadhar Tarkachudmani, a well-known scholar, began to interpret Hinduism from the scientific point of view and gave a series of lectures on the six systems of Hindu philosophy. Kali regularly attended those lectures in Albert Hall. One day he expressed a desire to learn the yoga aphorisms of Patanjali from him. But Shashadhar told Kali that he had no time and referred him to another renowned scholar, Kalibar Vedantavagish. Kali's desire to learn the scriptures was phenomenal. He went to Vedantavagish, who was then translating Patanjali's yoga aphorisms from Sanskrit into Bengali. Vedantavagish told Kali that he had no spare time to teach him the yoga sutras but he could explain the sutras to him in the mornings while his attendant gave him an oil massage before his bath. Kali began to visit the Pandit every morning. While he read the aphorisms, the Pandit would explain them. Thus he completed his study of yoga philosophy.
Kali then bought a copy of Shiva Sanhita and learned the disciplines of Hatha Yoga, Kundalini Yoga, Pranayam and Raja Yoga. He had a desire to be absorbed in Samadhi through Khechri Mudra, a special technique of Hatha Yoga, but he was told not to practice any of the methods described in Hatha Yoga treatises without being properly instructed by a competent yogi, with Sri Ramakrishna at Dakshineswar. The scriptures did not quench Kali's thirst for knowledge, so he desperately searched for a spiritual teacher. In June 1884, Kali went to Dakshineswar and met Sri Ramakrishna. In his autobiography, he describes their first meeting. I became restless to find a guru who could teach me yoga. I confided my desire to my classmate Yajneshwar Bhattacharya, who was very fond of me. Yajneshwar told me, I know a wonderful yogi. His name is Sri Ramakrishna Parmahansa and he lives in Rani Rasmani's temple garden in Dakshineswar. He has no pretensions. Many respectable people visit him, and he sometimes comes to Calcutta. Perhaps he can fulfill your desire to learn yoga. My joy knew no bounds when I heard this from Yajneshwar, and I at once resolved to meet Sri Ramakrishna, though I had no idea where Dakshineswar was. One Sunday morning I started for Dakshineswar by asking directions from people on the street. I crossed the Bagbazar Bridge and walked north on the Barakpur Trunk Road. It was quite a distance. I then asked a person on the road about the temple garden of Dakshineswar. He told me, you have gone the wrong way. The Kali temple is on the bank of the Ganges. Finally, I reached the temple garden at 11 o'clock. When I asked about Sri Ramakrishna, a temple worker informed me that he had gone to Calcutta that morning. I was exhausted, having walked all that way barefoot in the sun. Disappointed, I sat on the steps of Sri Ramakrishna's northern veranda and wondered how I could ever go back to Calcutta. I was hungry and thirsty. I was dead tired, I had no money, I had not informed my family as to where I was going, I had no acquaintance in Dakshineswar, and moreover I had no strength to walk back to Calcutta. I began to cry. Just then another young man arrived and asked me about Sri Ramakrishna, and I told him that he had gone to Calcutta. The young man was also disappointed. We then talked and got acquainted with each other. On inquiry I learned that his name was Shashi. He advised me about my circumstances, saying, Have a bath in the Ganges, take Prasad, and then return to Calcutta after a rest. Later in the afternoon, when I expressed my intention to return to Calcutta, Shashi told me, You should not return home without seeing the Master. Is there any certainty that such an opportunity will come again in your lifetime? Since you have come to see him with so much difficulty, it is better for you to wait. I knew my parents would be worried about me because I had not told them where I was going. Understanding how I felt, Shashi said to me, Look, brother, I have also come here without informing my parents. Don't worry. We shall stay here tonight. The master will positively return from Calcutta by late evening, as he never stays overnight at any devotee's house in Calcutta. Shashi showed me around and in the evening took me to the Kali temple to attend the Vesper service. I felt tremendous peace and joy. Ramlal, the master's nephew, gave us some luches and sweets for refreshments. We waited on the northern veranda for the master's arrival. Finally, a horse carriage arrived at the northeastern corner of the master's room and Shashi and Ramlal went to receive the master. My heart was beating hard. I stood where I was, motionless. After getting down from the carriage, Sri Ramakrishna said, Kali, 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 entered his room and sat on his small cot. Ramlal and Shashi informed the master about me while I waited on the veranda. 
Then Ramlal came out and said that the master was waiting for me. I entered the room and bowed down to him. The master asked about me and I told him, I have a desire to learn yoga. Will you kindly teach me? The master kept quiet for a while and then said, It is a good sign that you have a desire to learn yoga at this young age. You were a yogi in your previous life. A little was left for perfection. This will be your last birth. Yes, I shall teach you yoga. Rest tonight and come to me again tomorrow morning. The next morning Ramlal told me the master was waiting to see me. Entering his room I bowed down to him. He then asked me what I was studying and I replied, I am now in the entrance class, 10th grade. Dot. Very good, said the master. Then he took me to the northern veranda. He asked me to sit on a cot. When I was seated in the lotus posture, the master asked me to stick out my tongue. As soon as I did that, he wrote a mantram on it with the middle finger of his right hand and advised me to meditate on Kali, the Divine Mother. I did what he said. Gradually I lost outer consciousness and sat in deep meditation. I felt an unspeakable joy within. I don't know how long I stayed in that condition. After some time the Master touched my chest and brought me back to outer consciousness. He then asked me what had happened and I told him about my blissful experience during meditation. He was very pleased. Afterwards the Master instructed me on meditation and sang these lines of a mystical song. When will you sleep in the divine chamber with the clean, good and the unclean, evil? When these two wives are friendly to each other, Mother Shama will be within your reach. The Master further told me to meditate every morning and again at night and to report to him my visions and spiritual experiences. Then the Master asked me to go to the Kali temple and meditate there. When I returned from the temple, the Master gave me prasad and asked me to visit him again. He even offered to provide my fare if I could not get it from home. In the meantime, a devotee had arrived by carriage from Calcutta to visit the Master and the Master asked me to return home with that devotee. On my way back home, I thought of the Master's overwhelming love and compassion. Three meanwhile, a great commotion erupted at Kali's home when he had not returned by Sunday afternoon. His mother cried, thinking that he might have drowned in the Ganges. His parents searched for him in every possible location. At last his mother remembered that recently Kali had inquired about the temple garden of Rani Rasmani, so she asked her husband to go to Dakshineswar. The next morning Rasiklal reached Dakshineswar and learned from Sri Ramakrishna that Kali had already left for Calcutta. While leaving Dakshineswar Rasiklal said to Ramakrishna, Sir, Kali is my son. Please advise him to get married and become a householder. Your son is a great yogi, replied Ramakrishna. As he does not want to get married, what good would it be to force him to marry? Rasiklal said, it is the supreme dharma for a son to serve his parents, for Ramakrishna kept quiet. With great relief, Rasiklal returned home. Spiritual life is not always smooth and easy. Without exception, every seeker of God faces internal as well as external obstacles. After his first visit, Kali had felt an attraction for the Master, and whenever he could he went to see him in Dakshineswar. His father did not approve of these frequent visits and he locked the main door of the house so that Kali could not go to Dakshineswar. One afternoon someone left the door unlocked. Kali ran to the Aheritola Ghat and went to Dakshineswar by boat. That night he stayed with the master. Kali began to practice spiritual disciplines under the Master's guidance and through His grace was blessed with many wonderful visions of gods and goddesses. One day while meditating at home, Kali saw various gods 
and goddesses and divine incarnations, Krishna, Christ, Chaitanya and others, merge one by one into the luminous form of Sri Ramakrishna. He hastened to Dakshineswar and narrated this experience to the Master. To this Sri Ramakrishna said, Ah, you have seen Vakuntha, the abode of Vishnu. Henceforth you will no longer have these visions. You have risen to the formless state, five this proved to be true. From then on, during meditation Kali's mind was absorbed in the infinite, the vastness of the impersonal Brahman, rather than divine forms. After this vision Kali was fully convinced that the Master was an avatar, as he later wrote in a Sanskrit hymn to Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna trained each disciple separately. As Ramakrishna did not teach through books or through any set curriculum, it is important to learn from each disciple how he was trained. Kali wrote in his autobiography, Whenever I went to Dakshineswar, I would give personal service to the Master. I would carry his towel and water pot when he went to the pine grove to answer the calls of nature. Sometimes the Master would walk around the Panchavati with his hand on my shoulder. I also went with the Master to Girish Ghosh's Star Theatre to see the Chaitanya Leela and Pralhad Charitra plays. Every Saturday and Sunday devotees, would gather at Dakshineswar to see the Master. I also began visiting him on Saturday afternoons, returning to Calcutta the following day with some devotees. Thus I became acquainted with other disciples of the Master. I would really feel immense bliss in my heart to hear the teachings of the Master. When in ecstasy, he would sometimes laugh, sometimes cry, sometimes dance, and sometimes go into Samadhi. Again at other times he would joyously sing in his melodious voice the songs of Ramprasad, Kamalakanta and other mystic composers. Occasionally he would sing Kirtan, depicting Radha and Krishna's divine play in Vrindavan. Sometimes while describing the divine play of Rama and Sita, he would, like the great saint Tulsidas, float in an ocean of bliss. The spirit of the harmony of religions was reflected in Sri Ramakrishna's everyday life and he constantly taught his followers the liberal, universal message, as many faiths, so many paths. Ramakrishna also used to teach us to chant Haribol. Haribol, literally, chant the name of the Lord loudly while clapping our hands. When somebody asked him the reason for clapping one's hands, he said, as the birds of the tree fly away when one claps one's hands loudly, so the sinful thoughts of the mind go away when one chants God's name while clapping one's hands. Every evening in Dakshineswar the master would sit on his bed facing the north and repeat, Haribol, Haribol while clapping his hands. Sometimes he would repeat, Hari is my Guru, my Guru is Hari. O Krishna, O Krishna! O Govinda, you are my life and soul. Not I, not I, but thou, thou. I am an instrument, you are the operator. Then he would go into ecstasy. In that state he would importune Mother Kali, but his words would not be audible to us. Watching his God-intoxicated state we were amazed. We felt that the Master was in communion with the Divine Mother, that he was talking to her and that the mother was answering his questions. We realized that Sri Ramakrishna was not a human being. He was God. Ramakrishna taught us to practice Japam and meditation every morning and evening. About meditation, he sometimes referred to his naked Guru Tota Puri's illustration, telling us, Tota used to say that if a brass water pot is not cleansed every day, stains accumulate on it likewise, if the mind is not cleansed by meditation every day, impurities accumulate in it. Sometimes while teaching us, the master would tell us about his own sadhana. He said, when I meditated I became like a motionless stone image. Sometimes birds sat on my head, but I could not feel them. In fact, during deep meditation, when the mind becomes still and motionless, 
one does not notice if flies or mosquitoes sit on the body. The master used to say that this is a sign of a concentrated mind. Six. Whenever Ramakrishna visited the devotees' homes in Calcutta, Kali would go there and listen to the master seven as wonderful conversations. On 3rd July 1884, he went to Balaram's house in Bagbajar, where the master had gone to attend the chariot festival of Jagannath, Krishna. Kali recorded the event. Many devotees were present and Vaishnav Charan Sankirtan, O Tang, always repeat the name of Mother Durga, who but your Mother Durga will save you in distress. As soon as Sri Ramakrishna heard a line or two of the song, he went into Samadhi. Then the Master sang, O Mother, for Yashoda thou wouldst dance when she called thee her precious blue jewel. In the meantime, a small decorated chariot of Lord Jagannath had been brought to the upper veranda and the Master pulled it along with the devotees. While pulling the chariot, the Master sang, Behold, the two brothers, Gauranga and Nityananda have come, who weep while chanting Hari's name. He sang again, See how all Nadia, the birthplace of Gauranga, is shaking under the waves of Gauranga's love. It was a divine sight. The master sang and danced in ecstasy, and the devotees joined him. Afterwards, the master sat in the big hall and told Pandit Shashadhar, This is called Bhajminanda or the bliss derived from the worship of God. Worldly people enjoy pleasure derived from lust and gold, and devotees attain the bliss of Brahman through the worship of God. Thus the devotees passed joyful days with the Master. Seven Ramakrishna was very fond of ice cream. One hot summer day in April, a Calcutta devotee brought some ice cream for him, which he relished like a young boy. Coincidentally, from then on he had a sore throat. At first he ignored it, but it was finally diagnosed as cancer. Several doctors were consulted who prescribed various medicines. Despite his illness, Ramakrishna continued to teach his disciples. In the month of Jayastha, May to June, 1885 Kali went with the master to attend the Vaishnav festival at Panihati where he witnessed the master in Samadhi during Kirtan. It was the master's last outing. After this trip his pain increased and was unrelenting. He had great difficulty swallowing, eating and talking. Kali recalled, one day Golapma said to the master, Dr. Durgacharan of Calcutta is a reputable physician. Perhaps he can find some remedy for you. Immediately the master agreed to visit him. That night I stayed at Dakshineswar. Latu and Golapma were also there. The next morning the master, Golapma, Latu and I went to Calcutta by boat. After landing there, we rented a horse carriage and went to the doctor's office at Bidon Square. Out of his mercy the master asked me to sit next to him and Golapma and Latu sat on the opposite seat. The doctor examined the master's throat and prescribed some medications. Then we went to the Ahiritola Ghat and rented a boat for Dakshineswar. It was about 1.30 pm and none of us had had any food. The master was hungry. He asked the boatman to anchor the boat at the Barnagore Ghat and then asked me to buy some sweets from a nearby market. Golapma had four pies with her which she gave me. I immediately went to the market and bought some chanar murki, small, sweet cheese balls. The master took the packet of sweets from my hand and joyfully ate them all. He then threw the empty packet into the Ganges and drank some water from the river with his hands. He showed his satisfaction. The master knew that the three of us were hungry but without sharing any sweets, he had eaten everything. It was amazing. As soon as his hunger was relieved, our own stomachs felt full. We looked at each other silently. Then the master smiled and like a boy began to make jokes, which he continued all the way to Dakshineswar. We all got out of the boat, 
and later the three of us discussed what had happened and realized that it was a miracle. A similar event occurred when Krishna was alive and enacted his divine play. When the five Pandavas and their wife Draupadi were living in the forest during their exile, the sage Durvasa went to their cottage with his 1200 disciples and asked for food. According to the custom guests had to be fed, for otherwise it would be very inauspicious. Durvasa and his disciples went to the river for a bath, and while they were gone, the helpless Draupadi called on Krishna to come to the rescue. Krishna came and asked Draupadi for some food. There was nothing but a few particles of rice and a little spinach at the bottom of a cooking vessel. Krishna ate this and drank a glass of water and by doing so, filled the stomachs of Durvasa and his disciples. So it is said, if God is pleased, the whole world becomes pleased. That day I realized this truth by observing Sri Ramakrishna's life. Eight at Shampukur and Kosipore in September 1885, Ramakrishna was taken from Dakshineswar to 55 Shampukur Street in Calcutta in order to have his cancer treated. Several reputable physicians, notably Dr. Mahendralal Sarkar, attended him. Holy Mother took the responsibility of preparing his diet and the disciples, including Kali, nursed their guru around the clock. Kali recalled, One day the master was in deep samadhi, seated on his bed like a wooden statue. He had no outer consciousness. Dr. Mahindralal Sarkar checked his pulse and felt no throbbing. He then put his stethoscope on the master's heart and did not get a heartbeat. Next, Dr. Sarkar touched the master's eyeballs with his finger, but still the master's outer consciousness did not return. The doctor was dumbfounded. After some time the master returned to the normal plane of consciousness and began talking with the doctor about God. It may be asked why the master had cancer. It is really difficult to answer this question. Once while staying at the Shampukur house, the master said, The Divine Mother has shown me that people are getting rid of their sins by touching my feet. I am absorbing the results of their sinful actions, so I am suffering from this terrible cancer. This is called vicarious atonement. 9. Sri Ramakrishna lived in the Shampukur house for three months. However, instead of abating, his disease worsened. Because the air in Calcutta is very polluted, the doctors advised that he be moved to the country. After searching for a place, the devotees found a spacious garden house in Kosipore, a suburb of Calcutta, which they rented for 80 rupees per month. On 11th December 1885, the master was taken there, accompanied by Holy Mother, Golapma, his niece Lakshmi, and his young attendants. One day the master told his disciples, This cancer in my throat is a ruse. It is because of this that you have gathered together, ten holy mother prepared for the master a special diet, with Golapma and Lakshmi helping her. Gradually the number of attendants increased, so a Brahman cook and a maidservant were hired. Narendra created a schedule so that everyone could take turns serving the master. Kali would attend him two hours during the day and again two hours at night. The master would sit on a small stool on the terrace while Kali bathed him with warm water. After a few days in Kosipore, the master felt a little relief. The large room on the upper floor of the house was used as the master's bedroom to the south of that was an open terrace over the portico. The master used to stand on the open terrace and gaze at the trees and creepers in the garden. The fresh air proved to be beneficial for his health, and this raised the devotee's hopes that he might completely recover. One day Kali's father came to Kosipore and told Ramakrishna that his wife was crying bitterly for her son. He requested the master to send Kali home for a visit. Ramakrishna immediately sent Kali home. His parents were delighted to see him. Kali wrote in his autobiography, 
With tears in her eyes, my mother asked me to have supper and to stay for the night. But within half an hour, I felt uncomfortable at home. I felt as if I were in hellfire. My heart was restless and thoughts of the master haunted me. I tried to control my desire to run away from home, but failed. After hurriedly eating some refreshments, I said goodbye to my parents and returned to Kosipore. The master was surprised to see me and asked, Did you not go home? Yes, sir. I did. Your parents must have asked you to stay at home. Why did you not stay? I did stay. How long? For half an hour. But why did you return? I went with the idea of staying at home tonight. My parents also begged me to stay. But I felt great agony while I was there. My mind longed to return to you. While there I felt as if I were in hell. So I ate a few sweets and hurried back here after saying goodbye to them. My mind was pacified only after arriving back here. With a faint smile the master said to me affectionately, Very well. There is no doubt that you will have peace here. In fact, I always felt peace and joy when I was around the master. Parental affection seemed insipid compared to the master's pure love. Eleven, sometime in the middle of January 1886, the elder Gopal wanted to distribute twelve pieces of ochre cloth and twelve rosaries to some monks. Pointing to his young disciples, the master said, you won't find better monks than these. Give your cloths and rosaries to them. Instead, Gopal offered them to the master and he himself distributed them among his young disciples. Thus Sri Ramakrishna himself started his monastic order. Kali was among those who received an ochre cloth, the garb of a monk, from the master. It is an ancient Indian custom for monks to live on alms. One day the master asked his disciples to go out and beg for food. This act helps eradicate the ego and teaches one to depend solely on God. Narendra, Niranjan, Kali and Hutko Gopal first went to Holy Mother and asked for alms, chanting this hymn on the goddess Annapurna. O Parvati, the goddess of food, whose store is overflowing, O beloved of Shankara, Give me alms so that I may attain knowledge and wisdom. The merciful mother, taken by surprise, gave them a handful of alms. They then went from door to door begging for food. Some gave them rice, some gave vegetables or fruit. Some scolded them, saying, You young fellows, are you not ashamed to beg for food disguised as beggars? Go away and find a job. Some remarked, these young men are robbers. They have come to get information so that they can return at night and rob us. The young disciples endured all kinds of criticism. When at last they returned to the master with their alms, he was very pleased. Holy Mother cooked a portion of the food. After partaking of it, the master remarked, the food obtained from begging is pure. It is not defiled by anyone's selfish desire. I am very pleased to eat it today. Twelve Narendra was extremely worried about the master's physical condition. One winter night when he was pacing in the coast Sipore garden with Sharat, Kali, Niranjan and the elder Gopal, he expressed his thoughts to them, the master is suffering from a terminal disease. Who can say if he has not made up his mind to give up his body? While there is still time, let us make as much spiritual progress as we can by performing service, meditation and devotional exercises. Otherwise, when he passes away, there will be no limit to our repentance. To postpone calling on the Lord till desires are fulfilled. This is exactly how our days are passing and we are getting more and more entangled in the net of desires. It is these desires only that lead to destruction and death. So let us give up desires. 
Shortly afterwards, Narendra saw a dry heap of grass and some broken tree branches and said, Set fire to it. Holy men light dhunis, sacred fires, under trees at this time. Let us also light a dhuni and bum up our desires. A fire was lit and they meditated for a few hours, mentally offering their worldly desires into the blazing fire. It gave them tremendous peace and joy. At 4 a.m. they extinguished the fire and went to their beds. 13 The disciples learned a scientific religion from their master. One must first experiment with the truth, then verify it, and at last accept it. One day Narendra was having a discussion with Kali, Jogin, and Tarak on Hindu prejudices about food and the knowledge of Brahman. He said, after attaining self-knowledge, food can be taken from anyone's hand. Then one cannot look down upon anyone. As long as prejudices persist, Brahman has not been fully realized. Except for Narendra, none of them had ever eaten Muslim food. Come, let me break your prejudices today, Narendra said to his brother disciples. In the evening Narendra took Kali and others to a Muslim restaurant on Bidon Street and ordered chicken curry. After dinner they returned to Kosipore. Later that night Kali related the whole story to the master who laughed heartily and said, It is all right. You are now free from all prejudice. 14. When Kali was not serving the master, he would meditate and study Eastern and Western philosophy. Once he was reading John Stuart Mill's Logic, Philosophy and Essays on Religion. One night, seeing him reading in his room, the master asked, My boy, what are you reading? It is an English book on logic that teaches how to make arguments about the existence of God, replied Kali. Very well, Ramakrishna replied. It is you who have introduced the habit of reading among the boys. You should know that book learning is of no value. If you want to kill yourself, a nail cutter can serve the purpose. But if you are to kill others, you need swords, shields and other weapons. Study is necessary for that purpose. Those who will teach people are to read books. 15. It was March 1886. During Shivratri, the spring festival of Lord Shiva, the disciples of Ramakrishna observed a fast and a vigil, worshipping the Lord four times throughout the night. During the break after the first worship, all left the room except Narendra and Kali. Suddenly Narendra wanted to use Kali to test his power to transmit superconsciousness. He said to Kali, Please touch me for a while. A little later another disciple entered the room and found Narendra in deep meditation and Kali seated, touching Narendra's right knee, his hand rapidly trembling. After a few minutes Narendra opened his eyes and inquired, How did you feel? Kali replied, I felt as if a current were entering into me, just as when one holds an electric battery, one's hand trembles all the while. 16. During the second worship Kali went into deep meditation and lost outer consciousness. His body became stiff and his neck and head were a little bent. After the last worship Shashi came to the worship room and informed Narendra that the master wanted to see him. As soon as Narendra entered the room, the master said, Well, you are frittering away your power before you have accumulated enough. Gather it first and then you will understand how much of it you should spend and in what way. Mother will let you know. Do you understand what great harm you have done to that boy by infusing your idea into him? He had been following a particular line for a long time. All is spoilt now. Well, what's done is done. Never do it again. However, the boy is lucky, 17 Narendra was dumbfounded. From that time onward, Kali defended his actions through non-dualistic Vedanta. Studying the Ashtavakra Sanhita and practicing discrimination between the real and the unreal through the neti neti, not this, 
not this, process of non-dualistic Vedanta, Kali began to argue against others' ideas about blind faith in God. When the elder Gopal reported to Ramakrishna that Kali had become an atheist, the master smiled. However, when Kali was serving the master one night, he said, Hello, I hear you have become an atheist. Kali kept quiet. The master questioned him further, Do you believe in God? Do you accept the validity of the scriptures? No, sir, replied Kali. To this the dot master said, If you had said this to another holy man, he would have slapped your face. Sir, you are free to do so. As long as I do not realize that God exists and that the Vedas are true, how can I blindly accept these things? If you kindly enlighten me and give me spiritual insight, I shall accept them all. Kali's sincerity impressed Ramakrishna who said with delight, A day will come when you will know and accept everything, but don't be one-sided. I don't care for one-sidedness. Eighteen one can refute another's ideas, but one cannot refute another's experience, just as the taste of sugar's sweetness cannot be nullified by arguing against it. Sri Ramakrishna knew that words were not enough to convince his disciple, so he began to resolve Kali's doubts and misconceptions about Brahman by giving him his own experience of cosmic consciousness. Kali wrote in his autobiography, One afternoon, while the master was lying on his bed, a man was pacing back and forth outside on the green lawn of the garden house. The master said to me, Please ask that man not to walk on the grass. I am in great pain, as if he were walking on my chest. I was amazed when I heard his words and actually saw the man on the grass. I hurriedly went outside and asked the man not to walk on the grass. Then the master was relieved. Pandit Shashadhar had great love and respect for Sri Ramakrishna. One day he came to see the master at Kos Sipore when the cancer was in an advanced stage. Shashadhar said to the master, Sir, if you put your mind on your throat a little, your cancer will surely be cured. The master answered, how can the mind that I have already offered to the Lord be diverted again to this body of flesh and blood? But still Shashadhar pleaded, Sir, when you talk to the Divine Mother, please ask her to cure your cancer. Then the Master replied, When I see the Mother of the Universe, I forget my body and the Universe. So, how can I tell the Mother about this insignificant body of flesh and blood? The Pandit was dumbfounded. We too remained still. No one spoke a word. 19. At one time the main topic of discussion and meditation among the disciples in their leisure hours was the life and teachings of Buddha. Narendra was well versed in Buddhism and his enthusiasm was contagious. On the wall of the meditation room, the vow of Buddha was inscribed in bold letters. Let my body dry up on this seat, let my skin, flesh and bones be dissolved without realizing that enlightenment which is difficult to attain even in aeons, I won't let the body move from this seat. One day, Narendra, Kali and Tarak secretly planned to visit Bodh Gaya where Buddha had attained Nirvana. They left one evening without informing the Master. Tarak provided the passage money. They crossed the Ganges and took a train from the Bali station. After arriving in Bodh Gaya, they went to the temple and recited, I take refuge in Buddha. While they meditated under the bow tree, Narendra had a vision of light and he felt the presence of Buddha. Kali wrote, A current of peace seemed to be flowing all over my body. Brother Tarak also remained absorbed in deep meditation. Twenty days stayed in Bodh Gaya three or four days and at last returned to Kos Sipore. Sri Ramakrishna was happy to see them return. He remarked, Go around the world and you will find that true religion does not exist anywhere. 
वट एवर ऑफ स्पिरिचुअलिटी देयर इज इट पॉइंटिंग टू हिज ओन बॉडी इज ऑल हियर ट्वेंटी वन एम रिकॉर्डेड द एटीट्यूड ऑफ काली एट दैट टाइम इन द गॉस्पेल ऑफ श्री रामाकृष्ण शशि काली सेड टू द मास्टर वॉट्स द गुड ऑफ हैविंग जॉय द भील्स ए सैविज ट्राइब आर जॉयस सैविजेज आर ऑलवेज सिंगिंग एंड डांसिंग इन अ फ्रेंजी ऑफ द लाइट राखल ही मीनिंग द मास्टर replied to kali what do you mean can the bliss of brahman be the same as worldly pleasure ordinary men are satisfied with worldly pleasure one cannot enjoy the bliss of brahman unless one completely rids oneself of attachment to worldly things there is the joy of money and sense experience and there is the bliss of god realization can the two ever be the same The rishis enjoyed the bliss of Brahman. M. U. C. Kali nowadays meditates on Buddha. That is why he speaks of a state beyond bliss. Rakhal, yes. Kali told the master about Buddha. Sri Ramakrishna said to him, Buddha is an incarnation of God. How can you compare him to anybody else? As he is great, so too is his teaching great. Kali said to him. everything indeed is the manifestation of god's power both worldly pleasure and the bliss of god are the manifestation of the power m what did the master say to that rakhal he said how can that be is the power to beget a child the same as the power through which one realizes god 20 to 1 day vijakrishna goswami a religious leader and devotee came to kosipore to see shri ramakrishna While there he spoke highly of a great hatha yogi whom he had met in a cave of the Barabar hills in Gaya Having heard about the yogi Kali desperately wanted to see him He collected his train fare and without telling anybody left for Gaya From the Gaya station he walked 8 miles and reached a village at the foot of Barabar hills where he passed the night in an inn meant for pilgrims There he met a monk of the Dashnami Puri sect and copied from his notebook the monastic vows of Shankara's order Viraj Homa mantras including the Paresh mantram a special mantram math monastery madi sect and yogpatta name the next morning kali got directions to the yogi's cave but the villagers warned him not to go to the hatha yogi because his disciples threw stones at anyone who tried to go there But Kali was adamant about meeting the yogi so he took a back route through the jungle and began to climb At last he suddenly appeared at the entrance of the cave where the yogi was seated with his disciples in front of a dhuni fire They were about to attack Kali but he quickly bowed down to them saying Om namo narayane Since Kali wore a monk's ochre robe they also saluted him They asked him questions and learned that he knew the sanyasa mantras. It was divine providence that he had learned these mantras at the pilgrims in just the previous night. Kali asked the yogi to teach him hatha yoga, pranayam and other yoga techniques. But after interviewing him, Kali realized that he was not a perfected yogi. He knew only a few techniques of pranayam that had been mentioned in Pavana Swarodhya a book on breathing exercises Moreover Kali noticed that one of the yogi's disciples was suffering from asthma At that moment the compassionate form of Shri Ramakrishna appeared in his mind and he realized that he had made a great mistake Kali was now trapped he wanted to leave but the yogi did not approve and he was afraid to run away because the disciples might kill him in the afternoon kali pretended that he was going to bring water from outside the cave and then began to run down the hill the disciples started to throw stones at him but fortunately he reached the village without injury the next morning he took a train back to kosipore When Kali told Ramakrishna about his adventure instead of becoming angry he smiled and blessed him at this 
Kali realized the greatness of his Guru. 23 Shri Ramakrishna passed away at 102 a.m. on 16th August 1886. In his autobiography, Kali wrote a detailed account of the Master 7's death. Here are some excerpts. We saw the Master suddenly merge into Samadhi as usual. His eyes remained fixed on the tip of his nose. Narendra began to chant Om aloud, and we all joined him. We expected the Master to come back from Samadhi soon and regain normal consciousness. But as the whole night passed and his outer consciousness did not return, we lost hope and were at a loss about what to do. Gradually the news of the Master's passing away spread and people began to flock to the Kos Sipore Garden House, 24 at 10 a.m. Dr. Mahendralal Sarkar came and after checking the body declared that Ramakrishna had breathed his last. In the afternoon the Master's body was carried by his disciples to the Kos Sipore cremation ground. His relics were collected in an urn and brought to the garden house. The disciples decided to continue to serve the Master through regular worship, but they had no money and no means of support. Moreover, Ramchandra Datta proposed that the young disciples return to their homes and the Master's relics be installed in his Kankurgachi Yogodhyana. The disciples were helpless to prevent him from doing this. However, they took the main portion of the relics and put it in another urn that they secretly kept in Balaram's house, hoping one day to install it on the bank of the Ganges and build a temple there. On the birthday of Krishna, 24th August 1886, part of Sri Ramakrishna's relics was carried in procession by his disciples and devotees and ceremoniously installed at Kankurgachi Yogodhyana, at Barnagore Monastery and itinerant days. A couple of weeks after the passing away of Sri Ramakrishna, the grief-stricken Holy Mother left for a pilgrimage accompanied by Golapma, Lakshmi, M.S. wife, Kali, Jogin and Latu. They first stopped at Deoghar and then, after visiting Varanasi and Ayodhya, arrived at Vrindavan. The party stayed at Kala Babu's Kunja, Balaram Basu's retreat house. Once Ramakrishna had told Kali, there is a partial manifestation of Krishna in you, 25 during his stay in Vrindavan, he visited many temples and meditated on Krishna for long hours. Kali was very austere and adventurous. He decided to circumambulate Vrindavan with other Vaishnav pilgrims. It took 21 days to walk the 168 miles. One evening early in September 1886, when Kali was in Vrindavan, Ramakrishna appeared before Surendra Mitra in Calcutta and said, what are you doing here? My boys are roaming about without a place to live in. Attend to that before anything else. Surendra immediately rushed to Narendra's house and told him what had happened. He promised to provide the same amount of money that he had formerly given for the master in Kosipore. Narendra and the other disciples rented a house in Barnagore at 10 rupees per month and established the first Ramakrishna monastery. The Barnagore monastery was an abandoned, dilapidated two-story building infested with snakes and said to be haunted by ghosts. The rooms on the ground floor were dark, damp and unfit for habitation, so they were used as the kitchen and for storage. Shashi was once bitten by a snake in one of those dark rooms. The monks set up a shrine in an upstairs room, the relics of the master were brought from Balaram's house and a picture of Sri Ramakrishna was placed on the altar. The articles that the master had used at Kos Sipore were also preserved in the shrine room. Shashi kept the memory of the Master ablaze in the monastery with his wholehearted dedication and devout service to the Master. His scrupulous precision and regularity of service made everybody feel the living presence of the Master. As soon as Kali heard about the Barnagore Monastery, he returned to Calcutta and joined the Brotherhood. 
The southernmost room of the second floor was used for meditation and study and was known as Kali Tapasvi's room. Tapasvi means one who performs tapas, austerity, since Kali secluded himself there during most of the day. An ascetic by nature, he ate vegetarian food, wore no shoes and shunned people's company. He spent his time in meditation, studying the scriptures and composing some Sanskrit hymns on Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother. One day Kali visited Holy Mother at her residence at Nilambar Babu's house in Belur and read a hymn that he had composed about her, Prakritim Paramam Abhyam Vardam, etc., O Divine Nature Supreme, Remover of all fears, Giver of all boons, etc. After listening to the hymn, Holy Mother blessed him, saying, May Saraswati, the Goddess of Learning, sit on your tongue, 26. When someone in the Barnagore monastery complained that Kali was not taking any responsibility for the household work, Narendra said, Let one of the brothers be a scholar and I will do the dishes myself. One day Mahendranath Datta, one of Narendra's brothers, was shocked when he saw Kali lying like a dead person in the sun on the dusty floor of the veranda. Jogin told him with a smile, He is not dead. The rascal meditates that way, 27 sometimes the disciples would tease and make fun with each other. Ramakrishna had given them the taste of true spirituality, he did not care for dry monks. Poverty and hardship could not dampen the spirit of the disciples. They had mutual love, respect and deep understanding. One night Kali was shivering with cold and could not sleep as none of them had warm clothing or sufficient blankets. They used to sleep on the floor of a big room under a single mosquito curtain. When Kali told Narendra about his suffering, Narendra got up at 2 a.m. and made hot tea for his brother. He told Kali, enjoy this hot cup of tea and get rid of the cold. He also teased him, this hot cup of tea seems to me more concrete than your blessed theory of Advait, don't you think so? Kali, 28 Love and service bring solidarity to the order, not rules and regulations. Kali was well versed in both Eastern and Western philosophies and enjoyed discussions with Narendra. Latu recalled, Brother Kali was often busy studying the scriptures and other books. During rare leisure moments, he would debate with brother Loren Narendra. Loren used to silence him very easily, but one day Kali cornered Loren in an argument so well that Loren could not give a reply. Then Loren said, Let us stop here today. Tomorrow we shall start again from this same point. Brother Kali was very happy for the time being, but the next day Loren began giving new arguments that refuted Kali's points and Kali had to admit he was beaten. I couldn't defeat Loren for a single day, he said regretfully. But I told him, brother, it is bound to be so. Brother Loren is our leader. How can you surpass him? 29 One day Narendra proposed to the brotherhood that they all take the woes of sannyasa according to scriptural injunction. All agreed. When Kali told them that he had a copy of the Virajahoma mantras, which he had gotten from a monk in Gaya, his brothers were excited, knowing that this was the Master's divine grace. In the third week of January 1887, they took final monastic vows by performing the traditional Virajahoma in front of the Master's picture. Narendra gave Kali the name Swami Abhidananda. In March 1887, Swami's Abhedananda, Premananda and Sardananda went to Puri for a pilgrimage and stayed six months in the Amar Monastery. They lived on the Prasad of Jagannath, practiced spiritual disciplines most of the time and attended the Chariot Festival of Jagannath. On their way back to Calcutta, they visited the Sun Temple of Konark, the Lingaraj Shiva Temple in Bhuvneshwar and the Buddhist caves of Udyagiri Khandagiri. In 1888, Abhedananda went with Vivekananda and others to Allahabad to look after Yogananda, 
who was then suffering from smallpox. On 5th February 1889, Abhedananda travelled with Holy Mother and her party to Kamrapukur and Jairambati via Antpur. He stayed with the mother for some time in Jairambati and then decided to travel to the pilgrimage sites of North India. Holy Mother approved of his pilgrimage. Swami Nirmalananda expressed a desire to travel with Abhedananda, depending on God alone, they started their journey. Both Swamis resolved that they would not carry any money or pass the night in anyone's house. They would go barefoot and wear only lawn cloths. They also decided to live on alms that they would beg once a day. As itinerant monks, they carried only a blanket, a water pot, a staff, and an extra lawn cloth. They walked 20 to 25 miles a day. After walking over 500 miles, the Swamis reached Gazipur near Varanasi. There they met Sisir Chandra Basu, a judge of the Gazipur court who was then translating into English Panini's Sanskrit grammar and 460 times God lived with them Shankara's commentary on the Isha Upanishad. Abhedananda helped the judge with that project. At that time Hariprasanna, later, Swami Vijnanananda, a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, was working as an engineer in Gazipur. He was delighted to see the brother monks and showed both Swamis around the place. One day Hariprasanna introduced Abhedananda to another famous Sanskrit scholar who was a dualist. A day was set for a debate between the dualist Pandit and the non-dualist Abhedananda. It lasted for an hour and Abhedananda defeated the Pandit, greatly pleasing Hariprasanna and Nirmalananda. In Gazipur, Abhedananda met Pavhari Baba, a great yogi and knower of Brahman who lived in a cave. Abhedananda talked with him about God and was extremely impressed with the yogi. From Gazipur the Swamis went to Varanasi, the abode of Lord Shiva and Mother Annapurna. They visited the temples, circumambulated the holy city and met Swami Bhaskarananda and Trilanga Swami, two great saints of Varanasi. After staying a few days, they went to Ayodhya, the birthplace of Ramchandra. Then after visiting Lucknow they arrived at Hardwar Rishikesh, the abode of ascetics in the foothills of the Himalayas. Abhedananda built a thatched hut in Rishikesh like other monks, begged for his food once a day and practiced spiritual disciplines. From Rishikesh he walked hundreds of miles in the high altitudes of the Himalayas and visited Devaprayag, Joshimat, Badrinath, Kedarnath, Uttarkashi, Gangotri and Jamunotri. In those days it was not easy to travel to those difficult, inaccessible places. The Swami wrote in detail about his Himalayan travel in My Life Story. At last Abhedananda and Nirmalananda returned to Rishikesh. Abhedananda never cared for an easy-going life and always kept himself busy either practicing meditation or studying the scriptures. During his stay in Rishikesh, he studied the Brahma Sutras with Shankara's commentary under Dhanraj Giri, the abbot of Kailash Math who was an authority on the six types of Indian philosophy. Later when Vivekananda visited Rishikesh and asked Dhanraj Giri about Abhedananda, the latter remarked, Abhedananda, an extraordinary intellect. During his stay in Rishikesh, Abhedananda became ill with bronchitis and a high fever. Fortunately, at that time Turiyananda and Sardananda were there, they took care of their brother disciple and later, in March 1890, sent him back to Varanasi for further treatment. Abhedananda gradually recovered and returned to the Barnagore monastery. This time he did not stay in the monastery long, as he wanted to travel to other holy places in India. It is amazing how Abhedananda travelled Swami Abhedananda times 461 to so many places in India on foot like a true sannyasin, without money or possessions. He first went to Gaya and then Varanasi, Prayag, Agra, Delhi, Jaipur, Udaipur, Khetri, Mount Abu and Girnar. 
In Porbandar he heard that Vivekananda was in Junagadh, he went there and was delighted to see Swamiji. From Junagadh Abhedananda went to Dwarka, Krishna's kingdom on the coast of the Arabian Sea. A Gujarati devotee bought a ticket for him so that he could travel to Bombay by ship. From Bombay Abhedananda went to Mahableswar, where he again met Vivekananda. Abhedananda continued his journey towards central India and visited Pune, Baroda, Nasik and Dandakranya, a place connected with Ramchandra. Then he travelled to some important holy places in South India, Rameswaram, Madurai, Trichinpalli, Tanjore, Kumbhakonam, Kachi and Pakshatirtham. He had various spiritual experiences, visited many temples and places of interest and met a number of mystics and pandits. Finally, Abhedananda returned to Calcutta via Madras by ship. In 1892 the Ramakrishna Monastery was moved from Barnagore to Alambazar, not far from the Dakshineswar Temple Garden. The Alambazar Monastery was a large two-storey building with a number of rooms and pillared verandas. There was a lawn and a pond in the compound. A few suicides had occurred in the house during the occupation of the two previous tenants and the rumour had spread that the house was haunted. For this reason the monks were able to rent it for a mere 10 rupees per month. Ramakrishnananda set up the shrine and followed the same routine that had been established at Barnagore. By the grace of the master, the living conditions in the Alambazar monastery were considerably improved. Ramakrishnananda and Sardananda cordially received Abhedananda and arranged a private room for him in the monastery. The monks and devotees named it Kali Vedanti's room because he spent most of the time there practicing meditation and studying Vedanta. Some days after his arrival at Alambazar, Abhedananda became terribly ill due to an infection in his feet. His body became swollen and his feet were full of festering balls. The physicians found that guinea worms had penetrated his feet when he walked barefoot in Gujarat. Abhedananda wrote in his autobiography, The doctor operated on my feet seven times and I was bedridden for four months. I shall never forget Sardananda's untiring, selfless service to me as he constantly attended me without caring for food or sleep. Later Niranjananda came and began to nurse me. I lost my power to walk. After three months, I four sixty-two times God lived with them began to recuperate. Leaning on Sardananda's shoulder, I would walk a few steps a day like a child. Gradually, I regained my strength to walk. I shall never forget the love of my brother disciples. 30 in September 1893, Vivekananda represented Hinduism at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago and became internationally well known. Reports of the Parliament were published in Indian magazines and newspapers. The brother monks at the Alambazar Monastery were not at first clear about the identity of Vivekananda as they knew him as Vividishnanda. He had taken the name Vivekananda at the request of Raja Ajit Singh of Khetri before leaving for America. However, a letter from Swamiji, six months after the Parliament, removed all doubts and they were proud of their leader's achievement. When people are possessed with jealousy, they cannot discriminate between truth and untruth. But truth alone triumphs. Observing Vivekananda's success, the Christian missionaries and the Brahmo leader Pratap Chandra Majumdar began to slander him by telling the American people that he was not a true representative of Hinduism. In response to this false propaganda, Vivekananda wrote his brother monks at Alambazar. Hold a public meeting in Calcutta approving of my activities in America and mentioning that I am accredited to represent Hinduism and send a letter of thanks to Dr. Barrows, Chairman of the Parliament, with a copy to me, 31 immediately Abhedananda, Ramakrishnananda and Sardananda organized a big public meeting in Calcutta. Abhedananda temporarily moved to Balaram's house, 
so that he could easily make contact with prominent religious leaders, distinguished scholars, high government officials, writers and journalists of high repute, and other eminent community leaders. The monistic disciples and the devotees of Sri Ramakrishna took special interest in this sacred task, but Abhedananda took the lead. Most of the dignitaries invited agreed to attend the meeting, and the Honorable Raja Peri Mohan Mukhopadhyay promised to preside. The Raja was impressed by the newspaper clippings about Vivekananda in America which stated, After having him we feel how foolish it is to send missionaries to this learned nation. He remarked, India should remain eternally grateful to him for the highest honour accorded to him in America as a representative of the Hindu religion. 32 A very large public meeting was held on 5th September 1894 in the Calcutta Town Hall. The resolutions of the meeting were unanimously carried and were forwarded to Swami Vivekananda, Dr. John Henry Barrows and Mr. Mervin Marie Snell, President of the Scientific Section. Swami Abhedananda Times 463 Here is an excerpt from the resolution. This meeting desires to record its grateful appreciation of the great services rendered to the cause of Hinduism by Swami Vivekananda at the Parliament of Religions at Chicago and his subsequent work in America, 33 physically exhausted from his work, Abhedananda obtained permission from his brother disciples to go for rest and meditation in Nanital and Almora to Himalayan resorts. He took some Sanskrit and English books with him, which he read between periods of meditation. After some months, he returned to Alambazar Monastery in England and America. In June 1896, Vivekananda sent Sardananda from London to America to keep the Vedanta movement there alive. In July, he sent a cable to Ramakrishnananda. Send Kali immediately to London to assist me in my work here. I am arranging his passage, 34 accordingly, Abhedananda left for London in the middle of August 1896 and arrived there towards the end of September. On the way he suffered from seasickness and the lack of proper vegetarian food. Abhedananda missed Vivekananda and Mr. E. T. Sturdy at the dock, but reached Miss Henrietta Muller's residence at Wimbledon. Swamiji was worried at first but later was overjoyed when he saw that Abhedananda had arrived safely. The two brothers exchanged their news after many years of being apart. Swamiji arranged to buy new clothes for Abhedananda, showed him around London and introduced him to his friends and devotees. Gradually Abhedananda became acquainted with Western culture and way of life. A month after his arrival Vivekananda announced that Abhedananda would speak on Hinduism. At first Abhedananda was nervous and reluctant to speak, but Swamiji heartened him with inspiring words, Depend on the Master who has ever given me strength and courage in all the trials of my life. Out of the fullness of the heart the mouth speaketh. These words comforted him and gave him courage. Abhedananda based his lecture on the Panchadshi, an authoritative text on Vedanta. On 27th October 1896, he gave his maiden speech before the learned audience of the Christotheosophical Sortie at Bloomsbury Square in London. Vivekananda was highly pleased and said, Even if I perish on this plane, my message will be sounded through these dear lips and the world will hear it. 35. Vivekananda was fully confident that even in his absence Abhedananda would be able to carry on the Vedanta work in London. Swamiji entrusted him with his classes on Vedanta and Raja Yoga and left for India in December 1896. For one year Abhedananda continued to give classes and lectures in different churches and religious and philosophical societies in London and its suburbs. During his stay in London, the Swami became acquainted with many distinguished savants, including Max Muller and Paul Dusen. Abhedananda's eloquence, his lucid exposition of Vedanta philosophy, 
and his depth of spiritual realization made a profound impression on his audiences. To establish the order's work in India, Vivekananda called Sarada Nanda back from America. He asked Abhedananda to carry on the Vedanta work in the United States, so on 31st July 1897 Abhedananda left for New York and arrived there on 9th August. He was the guest of Miss Mary Phillips, the secretary of the Vedanta Society of New York, which Vivekananda had founded in 1894. On 25th August a reception for Abhedananda was given by the society. Abhedananda did not confine himself to New York City, he travelled and gave talks in various places along the East Coast, Philadelphia, Washington, Virginia and New Ports in New York State. He returned to New York City on 19th September. Sardananda was then preaching in the Boston and Cambridge areas and preparing for his return to India. On 27th September he came to New York and met Abhidananda. Both brothers were happy to see one another after a long time. They exchanged their news and experiences in the Western work. They met again at Mrs. Wheeler's residence in Montclair, New Jersey. One day Abhedananda went to meet Thomas Edison, the famous scientist and inventor. They talked about Vedanta and India, and Mr. Edison showed the Swami his laboratory. Abhedananda started a lecture series at Mott Memorial Hall in New York, which was rented by the Vedanta Society. On 29th September 1897 he gave his first lecture, What is Vedanta? Edward Emerson, a close relative of Ralph Waldo Emerson, presided over the meeting. About this first lecture, Swami Atulananda, a Western monk, wrote in with the Swamis in America. Punctually at three o'clock a Swami entered the hall. He was dressed in a robe and turban of an orange color. He went straight to the platform and without a moment's delay began to deliver his lecture. The discourse was lucid, convincing and impressive. There was not much flourish, not much eloquence, hardly any gesticulation. It was a straightforward, well-reasoned out exposition of Vedanta philosophy delivered in a calm, dignified manner, young, tall, straight, good-looking, the Swami had his appearance in his favour. I was told that the Swami I had listened to was Swami Abhedananda, another disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. On 2nd October 1897, Abhedananda began giving classes on Vivekananda's Raja Yoga twice a week, on Wednesdays and Saturdays. After the peace chant from the Upanishads, Abhedananda would meditate for a while and the students joined him. The class would last for an hour and after that he would invite questions. On Mondays he conducted lectures and classes at Montclair, New Jersey as well. The Swami stayed at the Brooklyn residence of Sister Ellen Waldo, a relative of Ralph Waldo Emerson. During this time the Vedanta Society of New York was moved to 117 Lexington Avenue, because its previous location had become surrounded by gambling and crime. The society's activities, lectures and classes, instructions and interviews at the center and in the homes where Abhedananda visited were carried on for over 20 years under his able direction. The publication department was organized and a monthly bulletin was issued early in 1905 as an independent source of contact to particularly serve those who lived outside the center's vicinity. The Swami worked very hard, he slept very little, as he spent most of the night writing his books, the sale of which eventually made the society self-supporting. It is said that libel and slander, Censure and criticism are the ornaments of those who pave the way for truth. Attacks from backbiters and fault-finders make a pioneering soul more strong and determined. When Abhedananda became popular in New York, some Christian missionaries could not bear it. Out of jealousy some fabricated scandalous stories 
टू डिफेम द स्वामीज कैरेक्टर अनडॉन्टेड अभेदानंद पेड देम नो हीड ही कंटिन्यूड टू वर्क विथ हिज यूजल विगर एंड सैनफ्रॉयड Abhedananda later told his disciples how he faced the trials and tribulations in his life when i was in america i would try to forget my sorrows and sufferings by singing or praying to the master i would spend my time practicing japam and meditation or studying books there was none with whom i could open my heart so i lived in my own world if a person upholds the truth he encounters more obstacles but one should never give up the truth one should hold the post i e god with might and main don't you see how i have confronted the storms of obstacles i don't care even if the whole world stands against me i am holding on to the master 37 from october 1897 to april 1898 abhedananda continued giving his lectures and classes in new york and gradually more people came to know about the society on 3rd january 1898 mr francis legett a wealthy 30 friend of swami ji invited abhedananda to his home and introduced him to miss emma thursby miss adams and other vedanta students and friends On 12th January Abhedananda saw Sardananda off for his return trip to India with Mrs Ole Bull and Miss Josephine MacLeod. On 25th January Abhedananda was invited for dinner by Reverend Heber Newton a nationally well known minister of All Souls Episcopal Church in New York. Reverend Newton was a liberal and powerful man and was attracted to the universal message of Vedanta and Indian philosophies. They became good friends and Reverend Newton often sent his followers to listen to Abhedananda. On 6th April Mr Legett introduced Abhedananda to Dr Elmer Gates, a famous scientist and psychologist who was then doing research on the relationship between physical science and mental science. Dr Gates was impressed when he spoke to Abhedananda about Raja Yoga, which he considered to be very rational and scientific. He invited Abhedananda to his laboratory in Chevy Chase near Washington DC. During the Swami's summer recess in May, he went to Dr Gates' house and stayed a couple of days. He also gave a few talks. Abhedananda expressed a wish to meet the President of the United States. Mr Arjun, a member of the House of Representatives, arranged his meeting with president mckinley on 19th may 1898 the president received abhedananda cordially dot and inquired about the vedanta movement in the united states and also british rule in india abhedananda also met john g brady the governor of alaska who invited him to visit alaska during the summer from washington dc abhedananda went to cambridge massachusetts to attend the cambridge conference at the invitation of dr lewis g james he stayed with dr james at the home of mrs ole bull who was then in india abhedananda was then the guest speaker at the annual festival of the free religions association held on the evening of 27th may 1898 at the parker memorial building in introducing abhedananda dr james said something of the thought that came into the transcendentalist movement consciously or unconsciously i am sure came from the old home of our aryan brothers in india something indirectly through germany something directly i know not how into the heart and mind of emerson it gives me great pleasure to welcome our brother from india swami abhedananda 38 the swami spoke on transcendentalism Abhedananda stayed nearly a month in Cambridge and Boston where he met several famous intellectuals such as professors Landman, Royce, Scheller and William James the author of the varieties of religious experience and pragmatism Professor James invited Abhedananda to speak in his house on unity in variety A discussion followed for 4 hours and at last professor james conceded the validity of monistic philosophy in 1898 abhedananda said in his lecture 
the ideal of vedanta and how to attain it the ideal of vedanta is to solve the problem of life to point out the aim of human existence to make our ways of living better and more harmonious with the universal will that is working in nature to make us realize that the will which is now working through our bodies is in reality a part and parcel of that universal will its ideal is to show us how we can live in this world without being overcome by sorrows and misery without being afflicted by sufferings and misfortunes that are sure to fall on every human being in some way or other how to conquer death in this life how we can embrace death without being frightened in the least and above all the chief object of vedanta is to make us live the life of unselfishness purity and attain to perfection in this life the mission of vedanta is to establish that oneness and to bring harmony peace toleration amongst different religions sects creeds and denominations that exist in this world dot 39 abhedananda lectured before the outlook club a women's group in lynn massachusetts and tried to remove misunderstandings about the position of women in india in this lecture the swami clearly outlined vedanta this religion of vedanta is not confined to any particular book it includes all scriptures and all the teachings of all great prophets who flourished at different times in different countries it is based on science philosophy and logic it harmonizes with the ultimate conclusions of modern science as truth is the goal of all science and philosophy so the same truth is the goal of vedanta modern science has discovered nothing that opposes the conclusions of the vedanta philosophy vedanta is a philosophy and a religion at the same time it recognizes each of the different stages such as dualistic qualified non-dualistic and non-dualistic in short it is the universal religion it embraces christianity and points out its fundamental basis it recognizes jesus as the son of god professor max muller says vedanta is the most sublime of all philosophies and the most comforting of all religions it has room for almost every religion nay it embraces them all 40 in august 1898 abhedananda lectured at the green acre conference in mani Miss Sara Farmer was the founder of this popular summer school for the study of things pertaining to higher life. Dr. Louis G. James, 468 times God lived with them, who was the president of the Brooklyn Ethical Association, conducted this school of comparative religions. Vivekananda had lectured and conducted a summer retreat there in 1894. and sardananda had spoken there in 1896 to 1997 neglecting his health abhedananda continued to preach and became sick knowing that the swami was not well and that he ate only vegetarian food dr jane told him that will not do for you here when you go to rome do as the romans do you have a mission in your life so you must take proper nourishing food otherwise you will be sick 41 holy mother also learned about his illness and she advised him to take fish and not to mortify his body with severe austerities after staying 4 weeks in green acre abhedananda returned to new york and continued his preaching as usual on 4th march 1900 the new york herald reported on how abhedananda trained the american children Every Saturday afternoon a class of young boys and girls gathers together in the rooms of the Vedanta Society in East 55th Street to speak an hour or so with Swami Abhedananda and drink in the teachings of the Hindu philosophy which is expounded to them in the most fascinating way. The young people come in with beaming expectant faces and draw their chairs around the handsome oriental figure of the Swami. who sits in the circle wearing a robe of rich red and holding in his hand an ancient sanskrit book the hitopadesha or book of good counsels this book is one of the oldest pieces of literature in the world 
It dates back to the 13th century BC and is the source of all of our fables of animals, our tales and fairy stories. 42. On Easter Sunday, 2nd April 1899, Abhedananda initiated six students into the woes of Brahmacharya, Gurudas, later, Swami Atulananda, was among them. In April, Abhedananda went to Worcester, Massachusetts, and gave a lecture entitled Hindu Religion. On 7th May, he spoke on immortality at the Cambridge Conference. This time he lectured in many places in the northeastern United States and also visited Niagara Falls. In August 1899, Abhedananda was invited to lecture before a spiritualistic camp meeting at Lily Dale, near Chattakui in New York State. He spoke on reincarnation to an audience of 7,000. On 4th August, he attended a seance where he saw automatic typing on a typewriter. In his famous book Life Beyond Death, he narrated some of his experiences in communicating with departed spirits. When Vivekananda returned to America for the second time with Turiyananda on 28 August 1899, Abhedananda was again busy with the Green Acre Conference. Vivekananda and Turiyananda went to Mr. Leggett's country home at Ridgely Manor in Stone Ridge, New York. On 7th September, Abhedananda received a cable from Vivekananda asking him to come to Ridgely, and the next day he travelled there from Boston. Abhedananda was delighted to see Swamiji and Turiyananda and gave them the news of all his activities. He stayed with them for 10 days and then returned to New York City. On 7th November, Vivekananda attended a reception given by the members of the Vedanta Society. The Vedanta Society of New York was legally registered as an organization on 28 October 1898 and Mr. Francis Leggett became its president. At that time, Abhedananda was lecturing regularly in a rented place, the Assembly Hall at 109 East 22nd Street. On 15th October 1899, the Society's office and library were established at 146 East 55th Street through the cooperation of students and friends. The lectures were then held in Tuxedo Hall at 59th Street and Madison Avenue. In May 1900, the Vedanta Society was moved to 102 East 58th Street, which became its headquarters. In July 1900, before leaving America for the last time, Vivekananda gave a few lectures in the society and complimented Abhedananda, I am very happy to see that the society has a house of its own, 43, actually, it was a rented house in a good neighborhood. Later, the society bought a house. From 1901 onwards, Abhedananda's audiences increased to 600 and the number of students in his yoga class increased so much that he had to give the class twice a day. To accommodate the overflowing audiences, the society rented Carnegie Lyceum for Abhedananda's lectures. The New York Sun described Abhedananda's lecture given on the first Sunday of 1901. Swami Abhedananda lectured in the Carnegie Lyceum yesterday afternoon on the religious need of the 20th century. He spoke of tuning the molecules of the brain cells to harmonize with the vibrations of the cosmic mind and so gaining power and he said that the mind and matter were not dual entities but the subjective and objective manifestations of the unknown. The 20th century needs a religion, he said with no scheme for salvation, no need for heaven or hell, no fear of eternal punishment. The 20th century needs a religion free from sacerdotal institutions and free from all books, scriptures and personalities. The 20th century needs a religion with a concept of God, not personal, not impersonal but beyond both, a God whose supreme aspect will harmonize with the ultimate reality of the universe. The 20th century religion must accept the ultimate conclusions of all the philosophies of the world. 
44 470 times God lived with them on 22nd June 1901 Abhedananda left New York City for Buffalo. New York to see the Pan American Exposition. After visiting Cleveland and Chicago, he went to San Francisco. On 1st August 1901, the San Francisco Chronicle published this news. Swami Abhidananda, who arrived here on Monday from New York, was the guest of honor at a reception given last evening at the residence of Dr. M. H. Logan. The Swami is a dignified, intellectual-looking East Indian. He speaks English fluently, and his thoughts as he gives them utterance are so framed as to form an axiom. 45 On 6 August Abhidananda left for Shanti Ashrama, a Vedanta retreat near the San Antonio Valley on Mount Hamilton, 20 miles from Lick Observatory. It was a quiet place and favorable for spiritual disciplines. Turiyananda and Brahmachari Gurudas received him cordially, but Abhedananda stayed there for only four days as water was scarce and the facilities were insufficient. From Shanti Ashrama, Abhedananda returned to the San Francisco area, giving a lecture on Vedanta philosophy on 6 September at the University of California at Berkeley. Abhedananda said, On one side, Vedanta philosophy gives expression to the highest ideal of all philosophy and on the other, it gives a foundation to a system of religion which is the most rationalistic of all systems and it harmonizes with the ultimate conclusions of modern science and philosophy. 46 From San Francisco, Abhedananda went to Los Angeles and then returned to New York on 7 October 1901 after visiting Yosemite Falls. Salt Lake City, Colorado Springs, Chicago, Toronto, and Thousand Island Park, New York. He continued giving lectures and classes as usual. During the summer recess, Abhedananda travelled to various places on the East Coast and then left for a European tour on 7 August 1902. He landed at Liverpool, England, and then went to Glasgow, Scotland. After visiting a few places in England, Abhedananda crossed the English Channel and travelled extensively in France and Switzerland. He returned to New York in the early part of October 1902. After the summer recess, Abhedananda arranged a memorial meeting for Swami Vivekananda, who had passed away at Belur Math on 4 July 1902. Abhedananda read letters from Sardananda and Premananda regarding Swamiji's death, Mrs. Olebul, Miss Josephine MacLeod, and others paid their homage to Vivekananda. The annual meeting of the society was held on 22 January 1903. The progress report was good, the society was sound financially and membership had increased. On 15 May, when the summer races had begun, Abhedananda left for Europe and travelled widely in Italy, Switzerland and Belgium. He returned to New York on 6 October 1903. Because the Vedanta movement was growing rapidly in the United States, the Ramakrishna order sent Swami Nirmalananda to America to help Abhedananda. Nirmalananda arrived in New York on 12 November 1903 and began to give classes in December. On 4 May 1904, the society was moved to 60 to West 71st Street. The building had a spacious hall that could accommodate 300 people. On 24 May 1904, Abhedananda went to St. Louis, Missouri to attend the World's Fair where he arranged for an exhibition of Vedanta literature in the book fair. He also gave a lecture at the Webster Groves Society on Indian Women and took a boat trip on the Mississippi River. On 16 June, he returned to New York. On 28 June 1904, Abhedananda again left for Europe. He reached Holland on 8 July and visited various places in Amsterdam. From there, he went to Munich, then the capital of Bavaria. During his European tours, 
He visited museums and places of historical importance and sometimes climbed mountains as he was very fond of adventure. On 16th October, he returned to New York after visiting Paris and London. The year 1905 was significant for the Vedanta Society. On 30th January, another Vedanta Center was inaugurated in Brooklyn, which Nirmalananda took charge of. On 1st February, Abhedananda left for Toronto and lectured at the Historical Society. He was interviewed by a reporter of the Toronto News, met many distinguished people, and then after visiting Niagara Falls, returned to New York on 7th February. On 27th March, he went to Washington, D.C. to form a Vedanta Society. He returned to New York on the following day. On 29th June, Abhedananda and Professor Herschel C. Parker of Columbia University, then President of the New York Vedanta Society, went for a long tour from Alaska to Mexico. They reached Alaska via Toronto, Fort William, Winnipeg, and Vancouver. In Alaska, they were Governor Brady's guests. The Governor's sister showed them the deserted homes of Native Americans and other important sites. On the way to Mexico, they saw the Portland Fair in Oregon, met Swami Trigunetitananda in San Francisco, and visited Swami Sachidananda in Los Angeles. They also visited the Grand Canyon in Arizona, and at last reached Mexico City on 14th September. It was there that Abhedananda met a Spanish gentle man who had read his books and who surprised the Swami by showing him a copy of reincarnation that he kept in his pocket. He asked Abhedananda to stay longer in Mexico, give a course of lectures and establish a center. Abhedananda returned to New York on 27th October via St. Louis where he gave an informal talk on Vedanta to an audience of 50 people. On Tuesdays during the fall, he lectured at the Brooklyn Institute of Arts and Sciences on India and her people, and on Sundays in New York, he gave a lecture series on the great saviors of the world. In this series, he pointed out, If we cannot recognize the divinity in the prophets of other nations, in the saviors of other people, then we have not realized the divinity of our own prophet and have not understood the eternal truth of the unity of divine being under the variety of names and forms. If a mother cannot recognize her son when he changes the color of his garment or puts on the dress of a foreigner, I am sure that she is not a true mother. Similarly, I am sure that the Christian who sees divinity in Christ alone and does not recognize his own master when he comes in the form of Buddha or Krishna has not realized the divinity of Jesus the Christ. All these prophets, these messengers of God, are great. Each one was commissioned by the Almighty to deliver his message. Each one of them was a glorious son of God, a perfected soul, manifested for the good of humanity to establish righteousness and to destroy evil. Forty-seven six months in India on 27th January 1906 Nirmalananda returned to India and on 15th April Swami Bodhananda was sent to New York to assist Abhedananda. Then, after working and travelling ten years in the West, Abhedananda felt an urge to visit India for a short period. The Swami left New York on 16th May 1906 and after changing ships at London, landed in Colombo, Sri Lanka on 16th June. Ramakrishnananda, Parmananda, Barrister Thyagaraja and Angarika Dharmapala, the Buddhist representative at the Chicago Parliament of Religions, received him at the port. On 18th June, the local Vivekananda Society honoured him with a grand reception. There Abhedananda was delighted to meet Ananda Kumaraswamy, who later became a great exponent of Indian arts. After visiting the Tooth Temple of Buddha in Kandi and the Bow Tree in Anuradhpuram, all three Swamis arrived at the South Indian port of Tutikorin. Abhedananda gave many lectures on this tour, and he received a warm welcome wherever he went. 
from Tutikorin Abhedananda and his party went to Tenevali and then to Madurai, Trichinpali, Padukota, Tan, Jor, Kumbhakonam and at last arrived at Madras on 15th July. The citizens of Madras gave him a wonderful reception and then, after resting for a few days, the Swami and his party visited Bangalore, Mysore and the Shringeri Math, which had been established by Shankara. After travelling in South India, Abhedananda reached Puri on 23rd August by train from Madras. Brahmananda, Shivananda and Premananda received him at the station and then, after visiting the Lord Jagannath, they arrived at Shashiniketan. On 9th September Abhedananda and other Swamis arrived at Havda station where a large crowd, including several prominent people of Calcutta, were waiting to welcome him. He stayed in Calcutta for a week and a memorable reception was given for him at the town hall on 12th September. In reply, Abhedananda paid a glowing tribute to Swamiji. Swami Vivekananda was not an ordinary man. He was the patriot saint of modern India. He may be called an incarnation of divine wisdom in this age of commercialism. It was he who turned the table of commercialism in a foreign land like America. He was the pioneer, the first preacher, the first Hindu sannyasin who went to the United States carrying his master's message and the gospel of truth as taught by our ancient rishis. Vivekananda represented the Vedic religion, the Sanatna Dharma, which we may call a universal religion. He achieved great success because he preached nothing but the eternal truth. 48 Abhedananda was happy to see him and other devotees of the Master. One day he visited his mother and went to Kaligat to offer worship with her. He then went to Belur Math and stayed with his brother disciples until 4th October. Abhedananda was delighted to attend Durga Puja after many years. Knowing the need for more Swamis in the West, the Belur Math authorities decided to send Parmananda to America with Abhedananda. On 5th October, Abhedananda and Parmananda left for Bombay by train. On the way, they stopped at Patna, Varanasi, Allahabad, Agra, Alwar, Ahmedabad, and finally arrived at Bombay on 30th October 1906. Back in America, 1907-1921 On 10th November 1906 Abhedananda and Parmananda left Bombay and arrived in New York during the early part of 1907. When he returned to America, Abhedananda reorganized the activities of the society. He sent Bodhananda to take charge of the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Vedanta Center and engaged Parmananda to conduct services at the New York Center. He kept himself free to lecture in various places, as well as to revive the Vedanta movement in London. During the birthday celebration of Sri Ramakrishna, Abhedananda said, The keynote of the life teachings of Buddha was active self-sacrifice, while the mission of Krishna to the world was to teach divine love. The great work of Ramakrishna was to bring the message of harmony. He came not to reform but to unite. He pointed out the wondrous fact that the religions of the world are not antagonistic in themselves, but that they are essentially one. Behind all religious doctrines and dogmas, the Master discovered one grand eternal truth. History has no record of such a saint. 49. On 2nd March 1907, a house was purchased for the Vedanta Society at 105 West 80th Street in New York City. It was a five story building with two rooms on each floor. The rooms on the ground floor were converted in TC, a single room that served as the lecture hall. Some of the upstairs rooms were rented to others in order to maintain the society. During this time the members of the society decided to establish a retreat site for students of Vedanta. Accordingly, a plot of 370 acres was bought in the Berkshire Hills, not far from the picturesque little village of West Cornwall, Connecticut.
It was 107 miles from New York and it took about four hours to reach. The Berkshire retreat was duly inaugurated by Abhedananda in March 1907 and he remarked, The ashrama looks like fairyland. On 26 June 1907 Abhedananda left for London, leaving Parmananda in charge of the society. In the second week of July the Swami began his classes on yoga and lectures on Vedanta in different locations around London. He returned to New York on 6 September 1907. On 29 January 1908 Abhedananda left for London. Sister Nivedita, Vivekananda's Irish disciple, visited Abhedananda many times and discussed the difficulties of her work in India. On 1st July, he inaugurated the Vedanta Society at 22 Conduit Street. Sister Nivedita spoke first, then Abhedananda lectured on the history and objectives of Vedanta philosophy. During this trip, the Swami visited Paris for several days and then returned to New York on 21st August. In September 1908, Abhedananda went on a lecture tour in Chicago and then Denver, Colorado. He returned to New York on 24th October. Towards the end of 1908, one of his disciples, Sister Avvamiya, founded a Vedanta Society in Sydney, Australia. Parmananda started a Vedanta Center in Boston, thus managing two centers. When not traveling, Abhedananda stayed either in New York or at the Berkshire Retreat. On 29th February 1909, Abhedananda returned to London. After staying there for a month, he travelled to Paris and founded a Vedanta Society. After a month of giving lectures and classes, Abhedananda returned to London on 6th May. On the following day, Frank Dvorak, the celebrated Czechoslovakian artist, came to the Vedanta Centre to see Abhedananda. At Abhedananda's request, Dvorak later painted all portraits of Ramakrishna and Holy Mother, which are still preserved in the Ramakrishna Vedanta Math in Calcutta. Abhedananda returned to New York on 26 June. Another of Abhedananda's important contributions was an Indo-American club, which the Swami formed in New York in 1909 so that Indian students could get together and come in close contact with American friends. For most of 1910 and 1911, Abhedananda lived in the Berkshire retreat and only occasionally was he in New York. He lectured regularly on Sundays and gave classes on yoga and meditation. Abhedananda's long absences from New York caused the income of the society to drop and most of the rooms had to be rented out to meet the expenses. Meanwhile, Parmananda permanently moved to Boston. Abhedananda moved permanently to the Berkshire retreat on 5th May 1911. On 12th June, he wrote to Brahmananda and asked him to send another Swami for the New York Society. Accordingly, in 1912, Bodhananda was appointed the head of the New York Vedanta Society. From 1912 to 1919, Abhedananda lived mostly in the Berkshire retreat and occasionally went out for a lecture tour. Mrs. Mary LePage, Sister Shivani, wrote in her book Swami Abhedananda in America. This ashrama in the Berkshires. 370 acres of rolling pasture lands and hills, a brook and several springs. Two old New England houses needing only renovation and some remodeling, barns, carriage house, sheds, all made to fit the purpose the Swami had in mind. The place within a few years was self-supporting, feed for stock raised on the place. Fruits of many kinds and a splendid kitchen garden kept the table well supplied for summer guests who came and went the season long. The place was kept very plain, everything simple, and the Swami's routines for the workers mainly voluntary and in line with training and aptitudes. There always was to be found among the students someone who had training as carpenter or knew something of the trades. 
The place was kept in good repair without hired labor. Always there was hard work to be done, always some addition being made, some project underway, nothing ever finished. Season after season the work went on. If ever Karma Yoga maintained a school for study such was here. Fifty Abhedananda was not only highly intellectual, a great orator and prolific writer, but he was also a hard-working, practical person. He taught his students to harmonize action and contemplation in their lives. There are many interesting entries in his diary of 1912, I planted with Le Page and Whitney Alaska peas, cauliflower, and cabbage seeds in the garden, started the engine with Le Page and it worked all right. Washed the dogs and cleaned their houses. Held classes in the evening. Worked with Frank at the stable. Picked pears and apples and packed them. I worked on the chicken house foundation with Whitney in the evening. Started the engine at 1.30 p.m. and cut wood until 2.30 p.m. 51 in February 1913, Abhidananda went to Jacksonville, Florida, and gave three lectures in a Methodist church, and then went to Atlanta, Georgia, to deliver several lectures at the Psychological Society, Unitarian Church, and Ethical Society. In Atlanta, Theswami said, Vedanta is the most ancient, and the most modern of philosophies. Vedanta stands for no special creed, philosophy or religion, but teaches accumulated wisdom. It stresses the Delphic oracle of Socrates, Know Thyself. It teaches that all progress is the evolution of God involved in man. Evolution presupposes involution, 52 For the next few years, Abhedananda mainly stayed in the Berkshire retreat and did lecture tours in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Minneapolis, Denver, Hartford, and other places. Swami Prajnananda recorded his reminiscences of Abhedananda in Mao Manush. In 19151, Abhedananda was in London. On 6th May I went to the booking office to purchase a ticket from London to New York on the SS, Lusitania. While I was in that office, a mysterious thing happened. I was about to buy the ticket, but immediately I heard a clear voice forbidding me to buy it. I was dumbfounded. I thought it might be a freak of my mind. I looked around but couldn't find anybody. So again I went to the counter and the same thing happened. Then I decided to return to the apartment without buying any ticket. However, I planned to buy the ticket the following day. The next morning I saw in the newspaper in big letters, SS Lusitania is no more. I was overwhelmed. Tears rolled down my cheeks. I realized that the Master had saved my life.53 on 7th May 1915, during World War I, this British liner was destroyed by a German submarine in the Atlantic Ocean, near the Cork coast of Ireland. 1,198 passengers died. In the early part of 1919, Abhidananda, with Brahmananda's approval, decided to return to India. He began to wind up his American work, he sold the retreat and all its furnishings. On 15th December 1919, he moved to New York, where Bodhananda and the devotees gave him a farewell reception. On 21st December, Abhedananda arrived in San Francisco. He Swami Abhedananda times 477 lived there for a year, lecturing regularly and helping Prakashnanda to organize the Vedanta Society after the death of Trigunetitananda. On 21st December 1920, he left for Los Angeles and lectured there till 19th June 1921, when he returned to San Francisco. Abhedananda finally left America on 27 July 1921. Abhedananda had gathered tremendous experience from traveling and lecturing extensively in Europe and America for 25 years. Since his arrival in the West in 1896, 
he had crossed the Atlantic Ocean 17 times and had carried the message of Vedanta to innumerable people. His writings also had made a tremendous impact on the Western mind. On the eve of his departure from San Francisco, the Swami said, The East and the West will unite, such is God's will. The signs of the times greatly encourage me, and my visit and prolonged stay in this country have clearly convinced me that it is possible to make the world our home and to love all as brothers and sisters. God's Spirit is working everywhere. Blessed is he who sees the work and realizes the Divine Spirit. 54 Back to India I sailed from San Francisco, wrote Abhidananda, and crossed the Pacific Ocean, breaking my voyage at Honolulu, where I was a delegate from India at the Pan-Pacific Educational Conference. Then I came to Japan and studied Japanese culture, philosophy, and religion, I stopped at Shanghai, Hong Kong, Canton, Manila, and Singapore, where I delivered the message of Vedanta philosophy in popular lectures. From Singapore I was invited to Kuala Lumpur in the Malaya states, where I gave a series of lectures on Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism before Chinese and Hindu audiences. From there I was invited to Rangoon, where after delivering several public lectures on the message of Buddha and religion of the Hindus, I returned to Calcutta, 55 on 10th November 1921, Abhedananda reached Calcutta and then went to Belur Math by car. It was noon and the shrine was closed, but a monk opened it so that Abhedananda could bow down to the master. Brahmananda and Shivananda were in South India, but Sardananda came the next day from Udbodhan to greet his brother disciple. On 25th December, a civic reception was given for Abhedananda at the Calcutta University Institute. On 10th January 1922, Abhedananda went to Jamshedpur and gave three lectures at the Tata Institute, Universal Religion, Progressive Hinduism and Message of Vedanta. On 13th February, Abhedananda went with Shivananda to Dhaka and Maimensingh in Bangladesh, where he gave 478 times God lived with them several lectures. Abhedananda returned to Calcutta on 26th February. Meanwhile, Brahmananda had become seriously ill and was dying from diabetes and cholera. Abhedananda visited him frequently at Balaram's house in Calcutta. Brahmananda passed away on 10th April 1922. It was during this period that a new chapter of the Ramakrishna order began. Shivananda was elected president of the order. On 24th April 1922, Abhedananda left for a lecture tour and pilgrimage to Shillong and Guwahati in Assam and after returning to Calcutta, he left for Tibet on 14th July. On the way, he stopped at Varanasi. Lahore, Rawalpindi, and Srinagar. He met the Maharaja of Kashmir, who arranged his trip to Tibet. He left Srinagar on 1st August. Abhedananda recorded in his diary, I went to Tibet and Kashmir crossing the Himalayas on foot to study the manners, customs, the Buddhistic philosophy, and Lamaism which prevail among the Tibetan Lamas. I went along Yarkand Road, the highway to Europe and stopped at Leh, the capital of Ladakh in western Tibet. My destination was the Hemis Monastery, which was about 25 miles north of the city of Leh. 56 Abhedananda was interested in visiting the Hemis Monastery because he had read in Noto which is the unknown life of Christ, which was based on a Tibetan manuscript preserved in this monastery. Abhedananda had some pages translated with the help of a Lama and later he wrote in detail about his journey and research on Christ in his famous book Journey into Kashmir and Tibet. The entire trip took nearly three months and he returned to Srinagar on 29th October. After visiting Rawalpindi, the ancient city of Takshashila, Lahore, Rishikesh, Hardwar and Varanasi Thay Swami arrived at Calcutta on 11th December 1922. In Calcutta and Darjeeling, 
In 1923, after returning from Tibet, wrote Abhidananda in his diary, I established the Ramakrishna Vedanta Society in Calcutta of which I am the president. In 1941 opened a branch of this society at Darjeeling under the name of Ramakrishna Vedanta Ashrama. 57. Why did Abhedananda move from Belur Math to Calcutta? Muni Bhagchi wrote in Swami Abhedananda. A Spiritual Biography When he returned from America, he returned with a huge number of books and furniture and a pile of his manuscripts relating to his innumerable speeches and writings, which were to be processed before publishing in book form. Those things remained almost unpacked for Swami Abhedananda times, 479 want of adequate space in the monastery of Belur. The Ramakrishna Mission Headquarters, in those days, had a limited number of rooms and it became difficult to provide Abhidananda with a suitable and even a sizable space. It was at this time that Swami Abhidananda held consultations with Swami Shivananda and Swami Sardananda and proposed to them that since there was difficulty of accommodation at the headquarters of the mission, it would be proper for him to shift to Calcutta and settle there and to carry on his own activities. It is on record that both Shivananda and Sardananda had given their consent to this proposal and accordingly efforts were being made from the beginning of 1923 to find a suitable house for Swami Abhedananda in Calcutta. Yet there were other reasons for his choice of Calcutta as the centre of his future work. It could be safely presumed that when he returned to India from America, he must have had some plans of his own, the realization of which needed a separate establishment, if not altogether a separate organization outside the order. He was one of the trustees of Belur Math, and as such there was no question of his disassociating from the parent body. 58 Abhidananda remained a trustee of the Ramakrishna Math and Mission all through his life but his organization gradually became separated from the Ramakrishna order. On 20th February 1923, Abhedananda moved to a rented house at 45B Mitchell Bazar Street, now Keshab Sin Street, in Calcutta, and again on 1st May to 11 Eden Hospital Road. He set up the shrine for Sri Ramakrishna, conducted lectures and classes, initiated some disciples and exchanged views with prominent national leaders. His dynamic personality kept him active till the end of his life. He continued his lecture tours in various places of India and began to publish his writings. The complete works of Swami Abhedananda comprise 11 volumes and are published by the Ramakrishna Vedanta Math, Calcutta. On 9th May 1923, Abhedananda visited Darjeeling, a Himalayan resort where many wealthy people go for their summer holidays. He stayed there for a couple of months and was greatly benefited by the beauty of the place and its invigorating climate. The following year, on 18th October 1924, he returned to Darjeeling and bought a cottage on a piece of land below the railway station. There Abhidhananda established the Ramakrishna Vedanta Ashrama, with an attached primary school, a charitable dispensary, and memorial building in the name of Sister Nivedita, who had died there in 1911. The whole hill town felt Abhedananda's presence during his two months stay there, thus many national leaders, such as Mahatma Gandhi, Chitranjan Das, Lord Lytton, then the Governor of Bengal, the Nawab of Dhaka, and others came in contact with him. Abhedananda told Gandhi, You are doing the work started by Ramakrishna and Vivekananda along the lines of removing untouchability and encouraging cottage industries. Therefore I bring to you blessings. 59 On 1st August 1925 the Ramakrishna Vedanta Society in Calcutta was moved from the flat on Eden Hospital Road, which had become insufficient, to 40 B. Don Street, a commodious four-story building. On 3rd January 1926, Abhedananda wrote in his diary, 
एट नून स्वामी शिवानंदा एंड स्वामी सरदानंदा मेड अ फ्रेंडली कॉल इन अ फोर्ड कार ऑन देयर वे टू एन इन्विटेशन फॉर अ फीस्ट वी हैड अ नाइस टॉक क्वाइटली दे शोड देयर सिंपथी एंड कोऑपरेशन विद द वर्क्स ऑफ आर सोसाइटी दे टुक अ लाइट रिफ्रेशमेंट एंड स्टेड फॉर एन आर सिक्सटी इन नाइनटीन ट्वेंटी सिक्स अभेदानंदा स्टार्टेड विश्ववाणी अ मंथली बंगाली जर्नल टू डिसेमिनेट द आइडियाज ऑफ वेदांता His life was full of various activities both in Calcutta and Darjeeling such as writing books and articles giving public lectures and classes on the scriptures meeting visitors and inspiring some young men to adopt the life of renunciation Abhedananda wanted to have a permanent home for the society so in 1929 a plot of land was purchased at 19 Raja Rajakrishna Street in North Calcutta It took several years to build the house. During this period the Swami lived mainly in Darjeeling. Towards the end of 1934 he moved into the society's new house and began to supervise the construction of the master's shrine which was dedicated on Sri Ramakrishna's birthday, 2nd March 1937. While installing the picture of Sri Ramakrishna, the Swami prayed, "Master, please dwell here to do good to humanity as long as the sun and moon exist 61 in march 1937 the centenary celebration of shri ramakrishna was coming to a close in calcutta abhedananda and vijnanananda were then the only two surviving monastic disciples of shri ramakrishna on 1st march the parliament of religions was held at the town hall in calcutta bra jendra nath seal an eminent scholar and philosopher and a classmate of vivekananda inaugurated the parliament but invited abhedananda to preside over it when he had to leave because of ill health abhedananda introduced himself i stand here not as a delegate from any institution not as the president of the ramakrishna vedanta society of calcutta but as the humble child of shri ramakrishna 60 to the next day the swami read a paper about shri ramakrishna it was his last public lecture he said for the first time it was demonstrated that all religions were like so many paths leading to the same goal that the realization of the same almighty being is the highest ideal of christianity mohammedanism judaism zoroastrianism hinduism as well as of all other religions of the world shri ramakrishna's mission was to proclaim the eternal truth that god is one but has many aspects and that the same one god is worshiped by different nations under various names and forms that he is personal impersonal and beyond both that he is with name and form and yet nameless and formless 63 on the occasion of shri ramakrishna's centenary celebration all india radio in calcutta broadcast abhedananda's 5 minute talk about ramakrishna in bengali It is the only available recorded voice of a disciple of Ramakrishna and it is the most precious verbal testimony about the master translated this testimony states Om salutation to Bhagavan Ramakrishna During the 19th century western materialism was deluging India The Christian missionaries through brainwashing were trying to create confusion and hatred in the minds of the hindus regarding their religion it was then that ramakrishna appeared to revive the moribund condition of the sanatana dharma eternal religion he was born in a remote village of bengal he had no formal education but he experienced the imperishable brahman and became a great teacher he did not care for dry scriptural arguments he solved the problems of life through his spiritual power he said the nature of all human beings cannot be the same it is natural to be different he respected all beings and worshiped the god of different religions after experiencing the truth of unity in diversity ramakrishna proclaimed as many faiths so many paths all religions are true The master's renunciation was phenomenal. While living in Dakshineswar and at the Kos Sipore Garden, we saw that he could not touch money or any metal. 
he perceived the manifestation of the Divine Mother in all women. Ramakrishna told us, He who was Rama and he who was Krishna is now Ramakrishna in this body. Pointing to himself, the Master further said, I will be worshipped in the homes of many people. Salutations to Ramakrishna, the perfect embodiment of the eternal truth that manifests itself in various forms to help mankind. He is an incarnation of the Supreme Lord and is worshipped by all. Peace, peace, peace. 64 In the early part of May 1937, Abhedananda left for Darjeeling, his favorite place. There, amidst nature's panoramic beauty and silence, he would remain absorbed in meditation, study, and writing. Most of his books and profound writings were done there. He would get up early in the morning and meditate, then, facing the peaks of the Himalayas, he would take his breakfast. Afterwards, he would go for a long walk, alone. And then from 9 o'clock to 11 a.m. he would write. After his bath, he would meditate for another hour and then have lunch. After lunch, he would read a newspaper, usually the statesman, and then would take some rest. Again, he would write from 3 o'clock to 5 p.m. and then go for a walk. In the evening, he would meet devotees and visitors and talk to them on various topics. After dedicating the shrine of Sri Ramakrishna on 29th August 1937, Abhedananda left Darjeeling on 21st September. It had been his last visit. On the way to Calcutta, the Darjeeling mail was derailed, and Abhedananda strained his heart as he hurriedly left the train. Completely exhausted, he returned to the Ramakrishna Vedanta math in Calcutta. From then on his health began to fail and water began accumulating in his system. Several prominent doctors treated his dropsy, but in the end he was under the care of Kaviraj Vimlananda, an Ayurvedic physician. His life's work done, he silently began to prepare himself for his final journey. On his 73rd birthday he said to one of his disciples, I am only an instrument in the blissful sportive play of the Master, and the moment my life's mission is over, I shall not wait even for a second longer. 65 Once Swami Brahmananda had remarked, when Kali reduces his external activities, people will realize the manifestation of his spiritual power. 66 Abhedananda was virtually bedridden for the last year and a half of his life. Even in that condition, every night after supper his disciples would read the manuscript of his lectures and he would dictate corrections. On 14th January 1938, in spite of his severe illness, he went to Belur Math to attend the dedication ceremony of Sri Ramakrishna's marble statue in the new temple. While Vijnanananda was installing the relics of the Master in the altar, Abhedananda stood motionless, listening to the monks singing a hymn he had composed for the Master during his Barnagore days. It was his last visit to Belur Math. Abhedananda had played his part in the divine drama of Sri Ramakrishna. Gradually the great yogi made himself ready to return to his beloved Guru. One day he said to a disciple, My body belongs to the Master. Towards the end he indicated that his body should be cremated at the Kos Sipore cremation ground after his death. On 7th September 1939, he followed his regular routine, but in the evening he had a high temperature that continued the whole night. His disciples served him around the clock. In the morning he felt a little better and asked his attendant to give him a glass of water. He sat on his bed and lay down after drinking the water. Swami Abhedananda passed away shortly after, at 8.16 a.m. on Friday, 8th September 1939. The news of his death spread throughout the city and an announcement was broadcast by All India Radio. The devotees and monks of Belur Math and all other ashramas flocked to see Abhedananda at the Ramakrishna Vedanta Math. 
his body was carried in procession and cremated at Kosipore cremation ground. His disciples followed his last request. Make a little place for me at the feet of the Master, 67 Towards the end of his life, this great austere Vedantin Abhedananda told his disciples, Tapasya or austerity enhances willpower. Have self-confidence, have faith in yourself. Think, I am a child of immortal bliss. The infinite power is playing within me. If you have this conviction, you will conquer the world.